Hello everybody, I am Dr. Arvind, diabetologist from Bangalore and I have here with me Dr. Krishna Sheshadri. And uh, Krishna Sheshadri is an American certified endocrinologist. Uh, he practices in Chennai. He actually practices in Apollo and it was so great that uh, I could meet him in Bangalore today. So I just got him to see a little bit of the beauty of uh, Bangalore and then also thought that we know we can probably have a chat and then you know we, we want to burst certain myths. Uh, Krishna welcome to Bangalore and welcome to this show today what we call as kind of a walk the talk kind of a show enjoying this. Oh, I, I love the Bangalore weather Arvind. Uh, but you didn't get me my coffee in the morning, so I'm a little grumpy, but we'll make up for it. <laughs> I think you'll definitely get your coffee when once this uh, shoot is over. Uh, can we start walking from now? Sure. Yeah. Krishna, it's very interesting because I, I met the kids of some of my patients today and uh, they were complaining about the cost of medications. Namaskara. 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 ತುಂಬಾ <laughs> <laughs> Uh, low sugar, this is a the father was obviously taking uh, some glenipiride metformin combination and then the local doctor at his place stopped the medication saying that it is going to cause hypo and it has a lot of side effects on the heart and things like that. So today I thought we will have to discuss something about this sulfonylurea metformin combinations. I mean where, where do you place them today in your armamentarium of the drugs that we have? Are they really bad or how do you look at it? No, not at all. I think what we, uh, what we need to understand is uh, the way we look at uh, diabetes care has evolved over a period of time. 20-25 uh, years ago, you only had two drugs. Yes. And, and uh, the, they were the sulfonylureas and the metformin. Unfortunately, the, they were an older generation of sulfonylureas which did have a higher amount of low blood sugars or hypoglycemia as you call it. Uh, since then things have evolved. There are two parts of this evolution. One is that uh, safer sulfonylureas are now available in the market. What they call as the smart and safer sulfonylureas. The next generation. The second generation. Of sulfonylureas are available that, are, that do not have the kind of hypoglycemia that were associated with the kind of drugs that our parents or grandparents took. This is one bit. The second thing is there has also been a proliferation of new drugs in the market with some benefits that include the heart as well as the kidney and other things. So the professional bodies that guide therapy have told us that in some patients these new drugs may be better. Okay. For example, if you have if you have heart disease, established heart disease, or you're at very high risk for heart disease, or if you have some amount of kidney disease due to diabetes, then it is probably a good idea to be on one of those medications. You're but talking about the SGLT twos here. The SGLT two inhibitors. The, then there are injectable drugs called the GLP one RAs, which yeah. clearly do have a benefit if you're at high risk for heart disease, or if you have some amount of protein in the urine and your kidney is starting to okay. sort of deteriorate. But in the absence of this, there is no reason why 
a patient should not be on uh, a sulfonylurea and metformin. So, what you're trying to say is sulfonylurea metformin is not just the drugs for a common man, it can be very safely used. With that, I would like to show you Ambedkar statue, which is right there opposite Vidhan Sauda. And uh, you know, this is the secretariat, and we take great pride as Bangaloreans. We would come here for regular walks, and then what you see opposite that is the High Court building actually. And uh, these two have been two monumental buildings, and quite close to this is going to be the Kaban Park, which we two will be actually going to now. And I would like to discuss about the efficacy of sulfonylurea compared to the other drugs as we hit the Kaban Park. Shall we go there? Yeah. I think we are just outside the Kaban Park here. Uh, one of the things is, you know, a lot of people go for jogging, a lot of people go for walking, dog walking. There is a dog park inside. I thought I'd bring you here so that it will be quite different from what you normally do in uh, Chennai. Uh, is it okay to sit here? Yeah, it's absolutely. You are comfortable. Um. I think. One of the important questions was, you did tell us about sulfonylurea and then why it's just a myth that it should not be used and it can be used in everybody. Now, what about the efficacy of sulfonylurea compared to the other drugs? So, remember that efficacy is a function of the level of glucose in the body. When we say efficacy, what we mean is its ability to bring down the sugars and keep it normal. The higher the sugar, the greater is the efficacy of any drug. So, uh, we use HPA1C, which is a marker of the three-month uh, three average, average of sugars. And uh, of all the drugs, the sulfonylureas have the greatest efficacy. Uh, the other drugs, whether it is the SGLT2 inhibitors, whether it is the uh, DPP4 inhibitors, which are now commonly used, I have moderate uh, ability to lower A1C. On the other hand, do, do you has, have any numbers to quote? I mean, HbA1C reduction by so much in so, so in average, uh, the sulfonylureas can go anywhere between 0.8 to 1.2. Okay. Uh, and uh, and it's important to remember that uh, most of this is achieved at the at half of the maximal dose that can be prescribed. In fact, many of us don't prescribe the maximum dose for sulfonylureas because as as the dose goes up, the risk of low sugars comes uh, comes up also. Yeah. So, but but clearly, if you want to, let us say you have an HPA1C of eight, which is a good way to start, and you want to bring your HPA1C down to seven, uh, the drug that is going to most likely do that is a sulfonylurea. If you have some, if you have an HPA1C of nine and you want to bring it down to 7.5, the, the drug that is most likely to be able to do that is uh, sulfonylurea is used alone. Okay. Most of the drugs, you will, you will require two drugs or three drugs to bring it down from a higher A1C to a lower A1C. Uh, so, what you are trying to say is you can always start with a lower dosage and then step it up so that the chances of hypoglycemia is lower. Absolutely. Okay. Now, but yeah. also to remember that, you know, that uh, the greatest efficacy is with the uh, sulfonylurea. So, most of us, when we treat patients, we we try to choose the drugs that that will bring it, bring the A1C down to the desired level. The desired level varies for different people. Correct. It's it's absolutely personalized, centralized. Depends on the age of the patient, comorbidities. Absolutely. So guidelines always say you choose your patient. You comprehensively ensure that you have actually looked at all his problems and then decide on a HbA1c. Now uh, we we have two drugs in sulfonylurea which are called the modern sulfonylureas, glycoside and glimepiride, and both have great data. I mean, there is hardly anything to choose from. It is just that glimepiride has become a little more popular. Any reasons for this? It, it all depends on uh, two things. One is, you know, what you as a doctor are comfortable with. It. Many of us as doctors, you know, try to choose, we don't try to do a spread of drugs. We try to choose one drug in a class, we are comfortable with it and then we learn more about it 
uh, with our experience with patients. Therefore, we are able to identify any problems that arise with it. Both of these drugs are comparable. Uh, one drug was is a little more popular in the United States. Another more popular in in, in the European and the Australian okay. countries. So where it started, where it was available, and you know where the doctor trained, all ever how, what is his or her level of comfort with the drug determines what is more popular. The truth is that these modern sulfonylureas, whether it is glimepiride or or glycoside, they are remarkably better than the older generation in terms of the safety, and they are as efficacious as the older generation of sulfonylureas. So, I would be comfortable with either. Uh, it is for the doctor to work with his or her patient or what is more, most comfortable for him or her. Okay. With that, I will be taking you through. I mean, you, your plus points and strong points is actually to dissect out some of the landmark trials and especially UK PDS, Accord, Advance, and VADP. I think we will take a break here. I want to show you some more places in Bangalore. We can stand near a tree, and then I will take you through the landmark studies. Okay. Yeah, so I see sulfline ureas have been used in most of the landmark trials that we talk of, especially the UK PDS, VADT, Accard, Advance, and other things. Mm -hmm. But each came out with different findings. Can you dissect these very quickly and tell our viewers what you found in these particular trials and what is the take-home message of these trials? So we must understand the intent of the trials first. Whether it is the UK PDS or the Accord or the Advance, the purpose of those trials was not to evaluate the sulfonylurea. The purpose of those trials was to find out if lowering the blood sugar uh, prevents the complications of diabetes. Okay, so that means we know that diabetes actually causes microvascular complications, Correct. also contributes to microvascular complications. So it was not designed to look at the drugs, but tight control versus the conventional Versus control. loose control, that okay. is all. Two things we learned, that if you are a new onset diabetic, that is if, yeah. you're, if you have had diabetes for a short period of time, when you control your sugars well, and you bring it down uh, to 6.5 or less, I'm using that number not from the trials, yeah. but generally, that there is a low risk of both microvascular as well as macrovascular complications. And if you're able to do that very early, that benefit lasts for a long period of time. Okay. What we call the legacy effect or metabolic memory. Okay. Why didn't we see this legacy effect in VADT and... Uh, well, it was present. Okay. It, the, there is a legacy effect, is a legacy but effect. the thing is that it doesn't last very long. Okay. Now, the important thing to remember is that in the Accord trial and in the VADT trial, we also learned that if you waited for a long time to bring your sugars down, then it doesn't cause especially benefit for the heart. And in fact, if you bring it down very low, then you may actually end up hurting the patient. So this was the purpose of the Accord, the Advance, the VADT trial. Incidentally, all of these trials use both sulfonylureas and the drug which was the standard of care at that point at that of time. time. And, and uh, some of the extrapolations we are making is from these trials. The trial, then there are a bunch of trials that were done by pharmaceutical companies when newer drugs came in to see if uh, they compared well with the sulfonylureas or as an add-on to sulfonylureas. In between, there were trials that, uh, that uh, were smaller, that looked at whether these drugs can work for a longer period of time. The problem with looking at trials is that when you use trials to, to extract information other than what they were intended for, okay. we always make uh, 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 unwanted or unnecessary uh, judgments about the drug. Okay, I, with, with that, that's a very interesting point you told me because uh, there are some discussions that hypoglycemia really did not kill anybody in whatever trials we saw, whether it is just an association of good control or it's actually causal. Does hypoglycemia really increase a cardiovascular risk? Because we don't have any 
human evidence. Of course, there are some experimental evidence from animals, but you can't do a trial to prove that. So you are so. So that. I wouldn't downplay hypoglycemia and its risks. Yeah. If this is real. It is real for patients, and any time hypoglycemia occurs, it does cause a setback to the patient. For example, it has been well shown, well known, that patients who have hypoglycemic episode lose their trust to the doctor. Correct. That that happens. They yes. reduce the dose of the drugs without letting the doctor know. They omit drugs, the drugs that. So we we must be careful about hypoglycemia. If you are going to go back to the trials and look at it. In the Accord trial, which was one of the most important trials that we have in terms of cardiovascular uh, benefit, that in the intensive care group, correct, uh, there was a higher amount of hypoglycemia. It was expected. Yes. And there was also a higher amount of cardiovascular complications. So, so there are two parts. You and I are going together. We can be uh, we can be walking seven steps together, but we need not be related. Yes. So this is called association. You and I yeah. are associated, but not necessarily related. Related. Okay. But absence of proof is not proof of absence. Oh, that that that's wonderful. I want you to say it again to the camera. Absence, absence of proof is not proof of absence. So let us not discount hypoglycemia. It is also important to know, and we saw that even in the Carolina study, that that there was an increase. Incidence of hypoglycemia in the sulfonylurea group. So it does cause sulf hypoglycemia, and that is how this drug works. Sulfonylureas work directly by increasing insulin secretion, while other drugs also increase insulin secretion. The, the association more of glucose dependent. Yeah. Right. Correct. So, so that sulfonylureas cause hypoglycemia there is no doubt no doubt yes does it cause as much hypoglycemia that it should be avoided definitely not okay i think with that that's a great message that we have received hypoglycemia definitely occurs with sulfonylureas but it can be minimized with good education you start slow and uptight rate to minimize as much as possible because hypoglycemia is a necessary evil Oh, we have a lot of dogs for company here. I think with that, we have to now cross the road and I have to take you on to the other side. Krishna, thanks for that uh, information, especially the last sentence that you said. Now, there was a lot of talk that, you know, sulfonyl ureas are not safe for the heart. There are no CVOT trials because obviously FDA never wanted CVOT trials when sulfonyl ureas were re released. But now after Carolina, this seems to have changed. Can you discuss Carolina trial to our viewers? And especially because glimiparide was pitted against linagliptin. And uh, it was that kind of a victory to glimiparide in that particular trial. Okay, I think uh, we must be careful about any trial. As I said, you know, we must be careful about looking at a trial and uh, uh, what is the purpose of it. If we try to extrapolate things that are not part of the purpose of the trial, we always end up making uh, different kinds of assumptions and judgments. What we know from the Carolina trial is that when it comes to the safety in terms of the heart, glimepiride and the DPP-4 inhibitor that was used which is linagliptin were similar. similar to each other. One was not superior to the other. other. So these are equals in the process. I think that we have learned. There are some places where we should still be uncomfortable with sulfonylureas in terms of uh, uh, you know the worry about cardiovascular illness and that would be one as I said the use of an older sulfonylurea. The second is in an immediate post myocardial infarction and somebody's had a heart attack immediately 
I think at this point of time we should we should be very proactive and say, look, an SGLT2 inhibitor should be added, added. and not a sulfur inhibitor because there there is an established benefit. Having said that, I think I think we have been unfair to the sulfur inhibitors in the past ten years. That that these trials, including the Carolina trial, have sort of cleared the air. Another interesting thing that uh, trial that people have used to beat up the sulfonylurea was the ADOPT trial, where they said that when you use sulfonylureas, that the that the pancreas, the beta cells in the pancreas, start producing so much insulin that they become tired. Okay, they get exhausted. And they get exhausted. Beta cell exhaustion was the word used. Absolutely. And we we now know that that you know that they are good for three years or three and a half years, which I think is a is a good number. Uh, for 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 a drug that is very cheap, that is very effective. So beta cell exhaustion is still a, is just a myth which has now been busted. So nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about it because we probably understand it much better. Okay. We know what is happening inside the beta cell. We know that also that the newer sulfonylureas they don't work exactly like the mechanism of the older sulfonylureas. Older Their action on the receptors in the pancreatic cell is somewhat different. From the older sulfonylurea, so so we haven't seen that kind of beta cell exhaustion that uh, uh, that the physicians of a generation ago saw. Yeah. Another thing that you know we we always worry about in a person with diabetes is, especially when it comes to the heart, the risk of heart failure. Because Carolina again told us that there is no increased risk of heart failure when it comes to glimepiride, and you would take on that. So, so heart failure is something that is being increasingly recognized as as a outcome of diabetes. We see it a lot more now because you know some of the major problems with the heart and diabetes, like myocardial infarctions, are coming down. Uh, but but heart failure is important. There is no signal in any. Remember again, the Carolina trial was not designed to look at uh, heart failure as a primary outcome. But they didn't see a signal for heart failure with the sulfonylureas, which was being speculated for many years. What we know is, to actually to sort of summarize it in in a different way, is that none of these drugs that we are using today uh, seem to be specifically harmful. There is a signal in two of the DPP4 inhibitors for an increase in. Not heart failure, but hospitalization so for heart, heart failure. failure. Yes, I think that's right. a that's an interesting point. Yes, right. For most of our patients who are not at that high risk level, who have established heart failure or established heart disease or established renal disease, it looks like all the drugs that are available are very safe. And I think that is a big information that we have in the last 20 years. Also, it's nice to know that. Our old workhorses in their new form, the sulfonylureas, okay. are as safe and as efficacious. But the important thing to remember is uh, uh, is to phrase. You should phrase Kalidasa both ways. Kalidasa said that just because something is new, don't throw it away. Okay. Just because something is old, don't question. Uh, don't stop questioning it. But it is true also the other way around. Just because something is new. Don't rush to embrace it, and just because something is old, don't throw don't away. It up. For a doctor like me and you, all these drugs are useful, right? We have to work with the. What is the what is the one important point in in choosing a drug? The patient, whether he has heart disease or kidney disease or heart failure, whether he needs to lose weight or not. Whether he has a condition that increases the risk of hyperglycemia, like kidney disease, or is this a person who doesn't uh, eat on time, or who cannot be expected to eat on time? And lastly, and probably even more important, is your treatment going to be uh, so expensive that he cannot run his life correctly? Right. I think that that's very important. Sometimes we should never forget that. I think thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Krishna. I think you, you have covered most of the points. The most important things I want to tell the viewers is, of course, someone will sum up this program at a later time, but I think 
Sunfly Media have stayed with us for several decades. They are still great trucks, especially combining Sunfly Media as a modern Sunfly Media with metformin has always been great. And as Dr. Krishna said, you have to choose your patients. Efficacy-wise, they are great. Probably they will beat the other drugs. Maybe a small risk of a little weight gain, which is also not a problem. You can readjust the diet, but the hypo threat definitely is there. So you need to do a lot of patient education and do inform the patients that hypoglycemia can be a problem and there are ways to avoid it. Remember, hypo is a necessary evil when we use insulin, we know that. But if, if used judiciously, I think sulfline urea and metformin combination are still a great force to stay with. Uh, with that, I will thank the delegates. Dr. Krishna, I would like to leave you to your uh, metro. I, I told that you would like to take uh, a metro ride back home from here. Back to my hotel at least. Yeah, back and to the hotel flight. itself. Yes, thank you. Hello friends, I'm Dr. Rajiv Kovil from Mumbai and today you had two top KOLs, Dr. Krishna Sheshadri and Dr. S.R. Arvind, roam around Bangalore and discuss science. And they spoke about a very contemporary topic, SU plus met in the management of diabetes. And I'm here to just kind of summarize it. Uh, importantly that the ADA today has put SU plus met as only when cost is an issue. And if you look at it or if you Indianize it, you'll see that almost 70% of prescription in India have a combination of SU plus MET. So it cannot be just cost as an issue or only when cost is an issue that you put SU plus MET. SUs have their good, bad and ugly side and as good clinicians, we should look at good and make sure we are able to remove the bad and ugly side. So if you look at potencies of SU, it's second only to insulin. They can easily get a 2 to 2.5% reduction in combination with metformin. And if you look at a pure glucocentric approach, uh, they are potent than most of the other oral anti-diabetics available today. Now, when would you shift a patient from monotherapy to dual therapy and today, uh, in spite of all the other agents which are insulinotropic, 60 to 65 percent of patients who fail to metformin are put on to an SU and in this case most most common SU being used is glimipiride. Now when would you use a, a dual drug at diagnosis if the HbA1c is more than 9 percent or if you are not able to get the patient to goal after three months of a monotherapy of a drug which usually in this case is metformin. Now it's always a difficult uh, 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 question when somebody asks that who should uh, marry metformin, that after metformin which should be the most ideal drug. And there was this study which was called GRADE which was started almost seven years back and which got presented at the American Diabetes Association scientific session in June 2021 which actually answered it but unfortunately the SGLT2s were kept out of this whole uh, race of who could marry metformin and that's why probably there is some gray area that we still need to kind of rack our brains about. So what was GRADE all about? It was a longitudinal study which looked at the durability of data, very, very similar to the ADOPT study. But here you had type 2 diabetes duration less than 10 years and we wanted to see that whether these patients did well with which, which kind of a drug when added to metformin. The GRADE study is one of the most first comprehensive study and what it first answered is that uh, SUs as they are known to cause beta cell failure do not cause beta cell failure. On the contrary, their durability is better than a DPP-4 inhibitor which in this case was cetagliptin. And uh, glargine which was the basal insulin and GLP-1 liraglutide did fare better than an SU plus cetagliptin. But most important to consider is that the SUs fared better than uh, a DPP-4 inhibitor. Now we have a lot of recommendations from the SAFIs which is uh, the South Asian Federation and also from an international task force which tells us that, that SUs need to be added very very early. Another uh, a very burning question 
is that whether you can use SUs in cardiovascular disease. The UGDP done almost, I think, four and a half decades back told us that probably some SUs, especially in this case, tolbutamide had some increase in cardiovascular events and SUs have evolved over the last five decades. And today we have a study called as Carolina, which was actually uh, linagliptin versus an SU and to see if there is any kind of signal towards any cardiovascular effect with any SU and in this case glimipiride versus linagliptin. And if you look at the three point mace between linagliptin and glimipiride in patients with established cardiovascular disease, no change, which means that SUs do not have any signal towards any cardiovascular toxicity. If you look at cardiovascular death, again, no changes with between linagliptin and an SU like glimipiride. So the whole uh, myth or misconception that the SUs may be having a cardiovascular side effect has been completely buried with the Carolina study. So in summarize, I would say that, uh, that there's very high prevalence of diabetes in India. SU plus MET need not be only be used when you have cost as a factor. Cardiovascular effects may be uh, similar to a linagliptin, uh, which, is a, which is a very good potent DPP-4 inhibitor with a lot of evidences. Hypoglycemia risk may be a little higher and that's where we come into being and we make sure we use the lowest dose to start up and up titrate slowly rather than go like cowboys. And this if you use SUs plus metformin in, in a lot of patients and you use them judiciously, you can get them to control without causing hypoglycemia. Uh, I hope I've been uh, able to add value in your clinical practice and we will come back to you next week with a new set of top KOLs in India, exploring a new destination and talking a completely different new science. Thank you all for a patient hearing.